no, Noel or Rose, their emails are up there, or you can just find myself or David, and we would love to get you connected with that. And so we are at the last Sunday of you know, 2017, and I, I really kind of was racking my brain on what to preach on. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of sermons out there today talking about New Year, new blessings, you know, um, you know, it's, just have, it's going to be a better year. More, it's going to be filled with more of God's anointing and, you know, his gifts. And I realized I could say that, but at the end of 2018, if you guys had a really rough year, you're going to come back at me and be like, listen, you lied. And so I realized I heard so many of those messages myself. And I, I remember sitting at the end of 2016, it was such a rough year for me. And I was thinking... This was not a year of new blessings, <laughs> okay? I, I, I can't count the gifts because, man, what a struggle it has been. And so at the end of 2017, as we were here, I don't know. Maybe some of you guys had the most amazing 2017. Um, I'm not going to lie. I had a pretty good year. Um, I got married, so that's, you know, that's, I don't know. That's all I need. <laughs> so um, it's been a pretty good year so far. Um, well, so far it's ending. But 2018, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be a year full of trials and tribulations and God just putting me through tests, um, or if it's going to, it might be the, even a better year. But I don't want to give promises of an empty, uh, a sermon of empty promises saying, listen, look forward to the next year. Because God has a different plan for all of us. And next year might be filled with some trials and some storms and some suffering. But I, I realize the one thing that we need to continually keep our eyes on is our one true King, Jesus Christ. That, that He is the one that we long for. He is the one that we await. He is the one that we should be expecting to come through in 2018. And so with that, let me just open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for um, just gathering your fellowship of believers, of skeptics, of those who maybe do, we just stepped into the church for the first time today. Um, Father, I pray that as we just come in this place and we sit at your feet, that your spirit may speak to us, that our hearts may be stirred to just love you more and have a deeper affection for you. Jesus, help us to remove all the distractions and the noise of this world and to be able to really just focus on you and may you be the central piece of our life and all, the, all of our purposes and our identity. Father, I'm not standing here by my own righteousness, but it's by your grace, your power, and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, you know, as we enter into the new year, obviously, it's nice that we kind of get a reset button, right? Um, just whether it's mentally, you know, literally as the new year comes in, but we kind of get to have a reset button. And, you know, all the things that, you know, we attempted maybe this past year, we're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to commit to it this coming year. Um, I don't know what those expectations may be. Um, you know, some of, I know we had a lot of newborns in the church this year. Um, praise God for that. And I know we have more babies coming. Um, praise God for that. And so I, we don't, we, I don't know. Maybe we're, there's some things that we're just eagerly anticipating for 2018. And maybe there's some things that we're dreading. Maybe there's some things that we're fearful of. But all in all, I think what the important thing is, is truly to keep our hearts and our eyes fixed on the unchanging principle that God is everlasting. That he is our one true king. And the reason I came up with this theme for the end of the year message is because I, I think in this generation, we live in a generation of kings. Um, but not like, you know, medieval times, like King Arthur kind of like type feel where like, you know, you have like the, monar the monarchy system. But I think we live in a generation of kings as in we have so many people in our culture today that are such strong influencers that whether they have an official political title or not, their creativity, their, their brilliant minds, their determination sets a standard for innovation. And there are people that we want to model after. There are people that we admire. There are people that we will, we're willing to follow their lead, whether we know them personally or not. You know, there, there, there are people in our culture today that inspire us. There are people in our culture today that motivate us to push forward and that we're willing to take the lead from, even though we've never met them face to face. And we live in a culture where that kind of like interaction makes it it's so much um, quicker and simpler than it was ever before. Even though I've never met someone and, you know, they, even though they may not know who I am, we kind of get a feel for their personality and their thinking, their thought process and their kind of like, you know, mannerisms just by how social media is so saturated. 
And so we live a generation of kings where we put people on a pedestal and they say, we want to follow after this individual. I want to be like them. I want to model after them. I want to model my future after them. They've inspired me in my profession. And so we live in a generation of kings and we, we, we kind of like, you know, we live in a culture where we, we, we admire that, we love that. You know, in magazines, we, you know, in the, in the Times, Person of the Year, like all these things, we're like, we put them up there. And so we live in a generation of kings, not in a sense where it's a political standard, where we have one person at the top, and like that person's ruling over everything, but man, what a, what, a, what a culture to live in today. And so in this generation of kings, the one question that I want to really beg to ask in every one of our hearts is, who or what was our driving force for 2017? Right? Like, who was the one that dictated each step of our life? Who was the one that kind of pushed us forward? Who was the one that guided us, discerned us, you know, gave, gave us discernment in processes of making decisions? Who was that person? Or what was that driving force? Maybe our driving force, you know, the, the king of our life is, you know, I want to become successful. I want to be in the top of my career, in the top of my field, in the top of my study, right? Maybe that was our driving force. Maybe our driving force was our, our pride. I don't want to look bad. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to look ashamed. I don't want to be ashamed of myself. I want to look back in the past year and say that I've done something with my life. Maybe the king of our lives are the things that surround us that kind of saturate our life daily. And we're like, okay, this is, this is my purpose. This is my identity. It drives us. And so often we're shaped by all these different kings, so-called kings in our life. And, the, and that's not unnatural. I think every one of us in our core being, we're, we're just looking for a king. We're looking for a savior. We're looking for something to kind of like free us or give us identity and give us purpose. Right? We want, like, I don't know if you've ever been to that point in your life where you just want someone to tell you what the right answer is. And I, I, I always get frustrated at mentors that never give me a straight answer, right? Because most of the times I'm asking them for affirmation, but they just end up giving me more questions. And I'm like, just tell me what to do. Tell me where to go. Tell me what I'm supposed to be like. And they're like, pray. I hate that answer. I'm going to be honest. As a pastor, I hate that answer. I'm like, I'm doing that already. I'm the, that's why I'm coming to you. Just tell me. And they're just like... Um, I'll pray for you. You know, like those kind of like typical, atypical Christian answers. Um, but I'm the type of just like, just, just point the direction. I, I, I want to go that way. And I know a couple of years ago that I was in that turmoil where it was just like, I didn't know where to turn to. I, I knew I was supposed to leave my former position as a pastor at a church, but I'm like, God, where? Where are you calling me? And I literally wanted someone to just come into my life and tell me, go here. But... As some of you may know, God doesn't work that way. And so we're constantly looking for a king, a leader to give us direction. We're also looking for a savior, someone to rescue us from the anxiety, someone to rescue us from the burdens, someone to just give us a clear picture of who we are. And I don't, I don't think it matters how old we become, but we're always fighting to figure out who we are. And we're figuring out, what are we made for? Because if we don't understand and we don't have that expectation of a purpose in life, of having and establishing an identity, every year that goes by, it's just another year. And we look back and be like, okay, what did I fulfill? What did I accomplish? And so we're, we're meant to adore and to worship something in our life. We're, we're, we're meant to just naturally have something supreme over our lives. So we're seeking something. So even if we're not Christians, we're, like, we're always thinking there's a higher being. There's a higher purpose. There's a higher calling, right? I don't know if you guys ever had that kind of like that epitome moment. I don't know whether it was just, sometimes it happens to me in the most odd places. I'm just driving. I'm like, who am I? Right? Like, what is my purpose? Like, I know I'm a pastor, but I'm like, is that my job? I just come in week to week, just greet people, you know, just do a couple of announcements and preach. Like, is that my purpose? Like, okay, maybe I need to do some Bible studies and connect groups. And like, is that, is that my purpose? So sometimes I just have like drives and sometimes I'm just sitting in the subway and it just randomly comes into me. Like, who am I? What is my purpose? And I think all of that really leads to who is our king? 
what is our king? What is reigning supreme in our life? Whose authority are we sitting under? And I know sometimes we, we hate that word, authority, right? In a culture today where we're all about freedom and independence, right? Just let me, I, let me be who I am, right? I want to do what I want to do. And we're just looking for every avenue and every way so that we can come out of authority and just to be our own individual. But here's the catch. Even if we come out of authority of a person, we, become, we come under authority of the world. There's so many things that influence us that even though we don't have a single individual telling us what to do or how to live, the culture is already dictating all of that. And so we see in Revelation, if you just read the Revelation, and Revelation is not just the scary book in the Bible. I read it as a kid, and I just, imagine, I just remember hearing about all these scary dragons and monsters and devils and demons. And I'm like, I'm never touching this book again. So I would read through like the entire Bible except for Revelation. I'll just skip that part. Like, I already know what's happening, end of the world, scary things are going to happen, that's it, <laughs> right? But if you actually read the Revelation, it is a pretty beautiful sight to just kind of watch and to imagine. Because most of Revelation, yes, the scary stuff is there, but it's about this picture of heaven, of admiring and adoring the true king of kings. And this passage in Revelation 19.16, it says, and on, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. See, if we believe in God and we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can't just take Jesus as our counselor, as our comforter, as our helper, without taking him as our king. It doesn't work that way. He's not just a consultant in our life, but he becomes the King of Kings. And this scripture, the only time I ever hear the scripture from other people is to tell tell me why they should get a tattoo, right? Like, on his thigh, he has his name written, right? I'm like, unless you're writing King, King of the Lord, I'm not thinking of tattoos. I just found it funny that people only bring that passage up when they want to get a tattoo. Um, but this idea that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and just to imagine, we come into church, and maybe we proclaim to be Christians and followers of Jesus, but how many times do we really, really accept him and give him authority as the King of kings, Maybe we give him authority of king of everybody else's life, but my life, right? Like God just tell everyone else what to do and how to live, but I, I, I got this. I know what I'm doing. When's the last time that we went to God in prayer and asked him, what is your direction? What is your next step? What, like, when's the last time that we just sat at the feet of Jesus and asked for his wisdom, his knowledge, and his discernment? You know, sometimes we just look at coincidences and be like, oh, well, that's God, right? God wants me to take this job because this job is the only place that wants to take me, right? This is divine appointment. <laughs> Could be true. But a lot of times we come to God as a consultant. We come to God as a deliverer. We come to God as someone that helps us in our troubled times. But if we truly want to follow God and accept Jesus as our Savior, it's a full package deal. And naturally, our hearts... We live to live, live for the king. There's this longing in our heart that we want to come under authority. And I know that sounds weird, and I'm going to get to this, but we want to come under authority because we know at the end of the day, living in our own free will and living in our own freedom is troubling. If we were allowed to do everything that we wanted to do, man, this world would be chaos. I know some of you are saying that the world is already in chaos, right? But imagine we're able to act on every one of our impulses. That we're able to act on every single thought that came to our minds. So creation, in the beginning, when God created Adam and Eve, they came under the authority of God. And God gave a clear, clear instruction. Everything else is yours. Just don't eat from this tree. And obviously, most of us know where this all went. <laughs> But we were created to be under the kingship of God. But we can't, we, we, we just seem to just not be able to get it. And here's a couple of reasons. It's kind of, kind of obvious, but the first one is we want to be our own kings, right? Like we don't want anyone ruling over us, right? In our culture, in our generation today, like to like say that we were under the ownership of somebody else, right? 
Like even like in workplaces, in corporate places, they're, they're, they're kind of dropping this lingo of like seniority. Um, I, I know that at Starbucks, one of the things that the CEO that he loves calling all the employees is we're partners, right? Every single person is a partner, whether it's your first day in your job or you've been there for 20 years, we're all partners and you have a stake in this, right? Because we don't, we don't like this idea that somebody has authority over us. We don't like the idea that somebody is telling us what to do. And, you know, not necessarily how to feel, but instructions. I mean, like, how many of us ever, ever read instructions, right? Like, if you ever, like, open up a furniture, I don't know, maybe, like, you know, other people, other people are different, but, like, as, as a prideful guy, I'm like, I got this. Pieces fit, that's all I, all I need to know, right? And at the end of it, I'm like, I should have read the instructions, right? But we hate get, receiving directions. We hate receiving instructions. We like to act on our impulses, we like to live in this freedom where like, we get to be our own kings because we like to micromanage the pieces of our life. And I'm, I'm kind of like that because I like to micromanage the pieces of my life because if something goes wrong, I know who to blame. It's my fault, right? But if I receive instruction from someone and it goes wrong, I'll like blow it up in their face. Like sometimes, okay, this is, I know I've been, I have a lot of confessional moments while I'm preaching, but a lot of times when I take directions from someone, sometimes I just do it to show them that they're wrong, right? Like I'll do it to the best of my ability, and if it flops, I'm like, I told you, right? I'm, I'm sorry, Dave. I, I probably, uh, but like it just, I just naturally do it because I realize I don't like to be under the kingship of somebody else. I don't like to be under the authority. I like to be motivated by somebody. I like to be kind of like receive kind of, you know, a push and be kind of be influenced by the innovation. But no, don't tell me what to do. I'm, I'm always battling that in my heart. And see, we think that if we just saw Jesus in real life, we would accept him as our king, right? Like a lot of times we think that, like, if I was one of the disciples, I would have never betrayed Jesus. If I lived eight and slept in the same building as Jesus for all those years, man, he would be supreme and king over my life. That is so not true. Because first of all, there was no appeal to Jesus, right? He, like, he wasn't this majestic king walking around and everyone's like, you know, he's like glowing and everyone wants to like be around him and praise him as king. I mean, he purposefully entered into the city on his final week riding a donkey, right? Like, there was no appeal to Jesus. And even the Jewish people who waited for Jesus for centuries, right, who had the prophetic word that a Messiah was coming from the genealogy, which is why Matthew 1 is so important. They said, if we just see the Messiah, we'll know. They saw him and crucified him. And ultimately, Jesus dying with a sign above his head saying, King of the Jews. So at the end of the day, even if we physically were, was able to touch Jesus, live with Jesus, hear from Jesus, our hearts are not inclined to say, you are my king. Because we like to reign supreme in our own life. We want control over everything. Secondly, we just simply don't want to be under authority. Um, I have this tendency to get really defensive. And so if somebody tells me that I'm doing something wrong, my natural inclination is to be like, you're wrong. Even though I know I'm wrong. Okay? Like, that's just my defensive nature. Like, I will fight tooth and nail to say that I'm right. Okay? And um, my, my wife and I, um, this is like 90% of arguments is because of me. Right? <laughs> She's like, your gloves are there. I'm like, no, it's not. She's like, I'm looking at it. I'm like, no, it's not. Right? I put it somewhere else. And then I'll be like, no, that's not the gloves I was looking for. I was looking for the other gloves. But in my head, I'm like, those are the gloves I was looking for, right? Like, I just get defensive, right? I just don't like being told that I'm wrong. And I think that's every one of our natural inclinations, right? We just get defensive. Because we don't like to be under authority. We don't want to trust someone else with the decisions of our life. We want to reign supreme. And our natural pride and arrogance creates an unhealthy independence. Now, I'm not saying independence is wrong, right? But I think it creates an unhealthy independence when we say, when someone tells us, you can't do that. And we say, you know what? I wasn't going to do it, but just because you told me I can't do it, now I will. <laughs> right? I think that starts even as children. 
right? I, I learned uh, when, when working with kids, I'm like, do not tell them what not to do because <laughs> they'll be more inclined to do it. <laughs> and I realized I'm like that too. If somebody tells me that I can't do it, I'm going to do everything I can to make it happen, right? I'll fail multiple times before I admit that I can't do it. We just don't like coming under authority. Our natural pride and arrogance fights this kingship that God is trying to deliver to us. And ultimately, if everything else fails, if we we're at the end of our reach and we say, okay, I need somebody to help me. I need someone to help piece together my life and give me some direction. I need a king. I need someone just, just tell me what to do. See, the odd thing is, that goes terribly wrong as well. Because <laughs> in the Old Testament, the Israelites demanded a king. See, Samuel was a prophet at the time, and he was getting old. Okay, this is in 1 Samuel. He was getting old. And he appointed his sons to kind of like help lead the tribes of Israel. And this, his sons were terrible, right? Like, they were just evil. And so the people of Israel were like, okay, God, you gave us judges. Okay, the Samuel thing, it didn't work out. We want a king. Right, and we, you, you see this in First Samuel eight. Sorry, print is so small. I read, um, but when they said, "Give us a king to lead us," this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, "Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not that it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king." And as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. And so I didn't put the next few verses up because we'll be reading the whole thing. But Samuel begins to tell his people, listen, you want a king, but I'm giving you a disclaimer. These things are coming. And he starts listing out these long things like, some of you are going to be subjected to slavery and be sent to war. Your children will be subjected to slavery. Women, you know, he's naming like all these bad things that are going to happen to them, to their children, and to their children's children. Like it's coming, generational stuff that's going to haunt you and hurt you if you want a king. And listen, if, if I had all those disclaimers, maybe I'd be like, let me think about this, Right? But this is following right after that kind of disclaimer and not warning. When that day comes, you'll cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations. And I just want to pause there for a second. See, the Israelites had no interest to be the people of God. They wanted to be mighty and powerful like all the other nations. And if we want to be mighty and powerful like the rest of the world and the rest of the culture, don't follow Jesus. Because that's not how to get there. I know it's weird. I'm like telling you not to follow Jesus. But in reality, if we're following God and he reigns as king over our lives, there's meekness. There's humility. There's deep, surf, there's deep suffering. There's persecution. We will be outcast. We will be spending time with the marginalized. We will be forgiving those who have hurt us. And we will not be strong like these other so-called nations. See, their fear was, I want to be rich. I want to be wealthy. I want to be prosperous as all the other nations. Their interest was in being the people of God. So they said, with a king, so we want to be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. A lot of times we think God's wrath and his punishment is not, is not giving us what we want. But in Romans, it clearly says that, Paul teaches us that ultimately God gives us over to our sins. That's his ultimate wrath, giving us what we want. So God gave them a king. And most of the Old Testament it's about prophets warning kings time and time again to come back to the Lord. Because, see, the people weren't interested of having a king that will lead them to follow God. Because they had Samuel for that. 
What they wanted was they wanted a king to fight their battles, to win their victories, to lead them into a prosperous nation, to, a power, to be a powerful nation. So the first king is, a, is assigned Saul. He's rejected. There's another whole message. Then comes David. Then the kingdom split, northern, southern kingdom. And if you ever see, there's this beautiful timeline um, that lays out all the kings of the northern and southern tribes. And literally next to each name is like, does evil, does evil, does evil. Kill, killed his father, became king, does evil. <laughs> you know, Manasseh, sacrificed children, does evil. And every now and then you get one good king, like Josiah, right? And there's some kings that they, they want the appearance of a nation following after God. So they'll get rid of all these things. They'll kill all these people that don't worship God, but they'll keep the idols. See, they wanted a king, but king after king failed in their duties to lead the nation to follow after God. Because they didn't realize that the one true king lies in Jesus Christ. That the one true king lies in who God is. And that he has to be the one that reigns supreme in our life. So, clearly we failed miserably in our attempts to allow Jesus to be king because our, our heart and our condition pushes back constantly. And we look for kings that will fulfill our needs and purpose. We look for things that are supreme that will say, this is where I find my meaning. This is where I find my identity. But God delivers his son Jesus. And this is another whole prophetic thing that you see throughout the Old Testament, the promise of the true king coming from the line of David all the way through. Now arrives Jesus, the Messiah, the Messianic King. And here's why he is the perfect King. He is eternal. When everything else fades, when everything in this world is forgotten, he will remain. His kingdom will remain. At the end of days, when all this is over, Jesus will still stand and sit on his throne. Secondly, he delivers his promises. He is a king that will never lie. He is a king that will never fall short of his promises. He is a king that will never, ever break the covenant that he has with his people. And ultimately, Jesus is the one. He's the one true king that can save us. He's the one true king that could deliver us from our heavy burdens. He's the one true king that could deliver us from our anxious nights. He's the only one true king that could bring us forgiveness when all we feel is, sh is shame and guilt. He is the only true king that could come into our life, enter in, and deliver us from our addictions, deliver us from our brokenness and bring healing. He's the only true king that can do that. Every other king will bring in empty promises that they'll deliver on their word, but they will not. They might bring temporary satisfaction, but God, he is the only king that could bring the promises that he has kept from the beginning. And if the worship team can come up at this time. And the one thing I love about Jesus as king, see, he ruled and earned his title as king, not by force. Easily, the son of God, right? He is king, that's it. There's no doubt about it. But instead of sitting on his heavenly throne, he gave all that up to come to earth to wear a title on the head of the cross that was meant for mockery, saying king of the Jews. See, he, he earned his title through sacrifice and self-giving. He didn't come into this kingdom, you know, as we talk about the Christmas story, he didn't come riding on this mighty chariot, ruling over the world, but he came vulnerable as an infant helpless he isn't a king that just took authority from people and it's funny because since the day that Jesus was born even prior kingdoms and kings were afraid of him King Herod thought this king of the Jews is going to come and take his title but he didn't understand the true kingdom that Jesus was reigning over and at the end of the day, on the week of the crucifixion, even Pontius Pilate looks at Jesus and says, are you truly the king of the Jews? That's what everyone is saying. And I love his answer, if you say so. Because everybody missed the point. 
even his disciples, when Jesus came back in the book of Acts. Jesus, when will you take over your authority? When will all of Israel be, you know, when all of Rome, all of this, when will all this be changed? When will we receive our titles in this political landscape? It says, it is not for you to know the time or day of the Father. See, even the disciples got the kingdom wrong. When Jesus says he's king, it's not just about a political landscape. It's about allowing him to be the king over our lives so that one day we can live in his kingdom eternally, gloriously, where we don't have to wait for the next year for new blessings, but every moment that we live there is just full of praise. And on his robe, and his, on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I want to ask us today, who or what is the king over our lives? Who reigns supreme in our purpose and our identity? Who dictates the shaping of our lives? Is it our own personal emotions? Is it outside forces? Is it some, you know, influence has come? I don't know. But today I ask as we enter into the new year, that every day, instead of awaiting new blessings, we say, God, come, come into my heart, come into my life and be the king above all. That we take our wisdom, our knowledge and our next steps from the king above high, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, that nothing in this world today can ever dethrone him. He is eternal, he delivers his promises and he saves. And so if we take a moment to pray right now. Feel free to take just a quick reflection on this past year. If the past year is too much, just the past month, past week or day. And just think.